Kia ora. Hello. This week, we're going to look at education in the medieval cities. I hope to have a discussion of how medieval people sought to educate their children and the way education was structured. As is often discussed on this channel, many of our modern ideas of the medieval period are in fact misconceptions. When it comes to discussing education, there is a view that the general population was generally unlearned, illiterate, and innumerate, both in the city and the rural landscape. It is often asserted that education was only available to the clergy, the very wealthy, males, or a combination of all three. As we discussed in our previous videos, that in the cities, many people were participating in trade guilds. To do so, they were apprenticed. This apprenticing system required years of on-the-job training to become proficient in their craft. While in the early years, the development of the medieval cities and craft guilds, many merchants and craftsmen required the services of a scribe to manage their accounts and business correspondences. This is clearly a limiting factor in the running of a personal business. As the complexity of business increased, the desire and demand for education rose within the cities. Urban people sought to educate their children in the skills they would need to be able to run businesses and to be able to enter into the workforce. So, how did these skills get taught? Were they taught ad hoc through the family, perhaps through the church, or was there another method altogether? Or am I just asking leading questions? What I'm hoping to do is show that the commonly held idea that all but the elite few were educated in medieval Europe was incorrect. That there was a system of education, that medieval society is much more sophisticated that we represent it. As usual, if you want to know more about the topic, check out our links below. I'm Andrew, and this is Popular Urbanum, a show where we discuss reenactment and the medieval middle class. Usually, when education is thought of during the medieval period, many people think of either the monastic schools or the medieval university. While both of these institutions did teach, neither were suited for the general education of children. Monastic schools were concerned with the preparation of students in becoming monks, set up to provide education for young monks. This did not provide space for those who needed education outside of ecumenical subjects. While the universities, as they are today, were places of higher learning, neither were places to go and learn basic numeracy or literacy. Often medieval universities accepted students much younger than today. And while grammar was included as part of the curricula, this is most likely as an attempt to remedy poor skills of students than a sign that this was the only source of learning. In urban spaces, we see the development of the cathedral schools, formed initially, much like the monastic schools, to provide education for young people in the skills in becoming members of the church. In the 12th century, the function of many of these cathedral schools start to change, changing into Latin schools, teaching Latin grammar, others into preparatory schools for young children. As the universities at the same time took up more of a role in teaching the liberal arts. Now, I just want to take a moment to discuss what I mean by the liberal arts without going in too much into the weeds on the subject because that would be the topic of a whole video in itself. Medieval people thought about education and learning of subjects differently. What was known as the liberal arts held a prominent position in medieval education. The liberal arts were referred to as the septeminum or seven arts which were divided into the trivium, three, and the quadrivium, four, respectively. The trivium included grammar, rhetoric, and dialectics, and the quadrivium comprised of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. The septeminum was taught not only as a subject, but also in interpreting the nature of that subject. So think of this as learning music and music theory. This is because medieval scholars believed that you were able to understand the nature of God by dissecting the nature of reality itself. Now, 
back to our other topic at hand. It is during the 12th century we see a third type of school appearing throughout the cities and towns, which we will call the municipal schools, although they have many other terms depending on the locales. This being a school more suited to the training and the skills needed in conducting trade. This included literacy, numeracy, and foreign language skills. The municipal schools are most likely secular and set up by city officials. This often put them in conflict with local bishops who saw that the church was responsible to educate children through the local cathedral schools. Additionally, these secular schools saw a reduction in children entering into the cathedral schools, which meant a reduction in revenue for the church. Of these municipal schools, we see a different type of schools being created, elementary schools and secondary schools, both teaching different skills. Elementary schools, were for little children, for teaching basic literacy and numeracy, while secondary schools were set up to teach more advanced schools. In Villani's Chronicle, he writes that in 1238 in Florence, there were between eight and 10,000 boys and girls learning to read, while there are six abacus schools for the training and preparing of a business career, which had between 1,000 and 1,200 students. There were four great schools for grammar and logic, which had up to 600 students. These schools were widespread through Europe. An early 12th century commentator wrote of schools outside of Italy, to say nothing of other parts of the empire. Are there not throughout France and Germany, Normandy and England, not only in cities and walled towns, but even in villages, as many learned schoolmasters as there are tax collectors and magistrates? It was not only boys who were being taught in these schools. There is evidence that girls were also obtaining education. In France, there were separate elementary schools set up for girls with their own school mistresses, with one mistress appearing in the tally in Paris of 1292, and by 1380, there were at least 20 throughout the different quarters of Paris. While in the Hanseatic League, the municipal schools taught both boys and girls, so too do we see this in Italy. Although, as with all things during the medieval period, this cannot be a hard and fast example, applied to all places and situations. Rural children appear to have had access to education, for example, through wandering scholars. Much like now, there were fees to pay for attending school. These fees paid for school supplies and the upkeep of the school and wages for teachers. Those that could afford to send their children to school, did. For the poor, there does seem to be provision made so their children could still attend the cathedral schools. At the Third Lateran Council in 1179, it was decreed by the church. Since the church of God is bound to provide like a mother for those in want, with regard to both the things which concern the support of the body and those which lead the progress of the soul, therefore, in order that the opportunity of learning to read and progress in study is not withdrawn from poor children, who cannot be helped by the support of their parents, in every cathedral church a master is to be assigned some proper benefice, so that he may teach the clerics of that church and the poor scholars. Thus the needs of the teacher are to be supplied, and the ways to knowledge open for the learners. Although this is a noble decree, it is unknown how many of the poor were able to access this free education. What we can see demonstrated is that there was an increase in education in the medieval period. We can safely say there is still high levels of illiteracy in the medieval period. During the early and high medieval period, traditionally the job of writing belonged to the scribe. Yet we see urban literacy and education improving during the later portion of the 13th century. With the development of the municipal schools, urban administrators, merchants and craftspeople start to write their own records, accounts and even write professional and personal correspondences. Accordingly, the need for the scribe decreases. Subsequently, it is during the 14th and 15th centuries we see the number of books being owned by merchants increasing. This cannot just be attributed to increased wealth, but also to the ability to read. This boom in education and literacy also has an impact on the medieval record keeping. Before the 13th century, many guilds and urban administrative records were mere lists. By the early of the 14th century, whole books of regulations and customs were being recorded, 
More importantly, it is by the hand of the members of the very guild. Another benefit for the medieval schools is a growth in professional classes drawn from the now educated middle class, such as doctors, lawyers, notaries, and other important officials who previously would have been drawn from the cathedral schools. These individuals are much more concerned with urban and civic ideals and have a more secular education than their ecumenical counterparts. This is an important step towards the birth of the Renaissance. Oh, I didn't see you there. That must mean you must have enjoyed the video. So why don't you like, comment, and subscribe. And remember, stay safe, have fun, and keep reenacting.